So as you know, the standards, the Quebec government standards were adopted in last May, this May. Finally, so Mike Cooper, uh, Mike Cooper mentioned this morning uh, the slowness of the process. I was talking for the standardization processes, and my colleagues know me. And I always show up with some Woody Allen, uh, something said by Woody Allen to explain it. And this citation one day, uh, Woody Allen said, eternity is long, especially towards the end. So for standardization, it tends to be the same thing. Standardization is long, especially towards the end. And those who followed our work uh, with the Quebec government, we were announcing uh, adopting the standards for a certain date, certain month, and it's been changed a lot. And that's pretty much it. It's the end of eternity is always longer. So I'm going to take this opportunity. Denis Boudreau this morning uh, spoke about a partnership when we did the standards, a partnership between the Office des Personnes Handicapées du Québec and the Ministère des Services Gouvernementaux, which is now part of the Secretary of the Treasury Board. But beyond the organizations, there were individuals. There was a, a committee. There were 25 ministries and organizations that were that were represented. And today I'm happy to count as participants, four participants in these works. So Alexandre Robert from the, Minist uh, the Ministère du Revenu, who's somewhere in the room. There's Alain Dubé, who's in the room as well. There's um, uh, Denise Deschênes and Anne Montabo from the Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec. So the standards, this is not a work for one ministry or two ministries. It's a it's a whole group of ministries that came together. And beyond the partnerships with the ministries and organizations, there was also the team that undertook this work, and I call it the dream team. So we had Simon Gaillardin from the Office des Personnes Handicapées du Québec. There was Jean-Marie Damour from the Institut Nazareth et Nouvelle Braille. There was Denis Boudreau, and there was myself. And we consider this uh, the dream team, and we had got these standards adopted with these two big teams. So we had the inter uh, ministry um, committee. So, so this is mandatory, and what this means is that the ministries and most public organizations in Quebec must apply the standards. This also touches other stakeholders. If we talk about the uh, suppliers of goods and services, consultants or people in communications who will work with an organization or with the government to develop, modify a website, well, now they must make their work accessible because they're doing this work for the government of Quebec. And there are some mandatory standards. And other stakeholders as well include uh, learning institutions which form and which will train the, the future web stakeholders. So it's important that as of today, these people be well trained and well prepared for the market because accessibility is a must. So within the government of Quebec, there were some rules that were more precise and now we have to take note of these changes and of these uh, new regulations. So we're talking about training uh, emerging workers, but also continuous education. So so we, uh, the, they, we go and see the old students to update them because the market is evolving. So not only are these stakeholders directly or indirectly, they must take into consideration the standards, but I would also say that in Quebec, uh, private businesses, uh, non-profit organizations, or other organizations that do not have to apply these standards should also get inspired by the work that was done within the government of Quebec, because we find there a level of detail that's quite significant There's and a good quality of work. I'll begin my presentation. And firstly, I'm going to do like we do at the movies. With the movies, we always have little ads uh, from the beginning. So I've got three slides. Unfortunately, I don't have any popcorn, but I'm going to try to get through this quite quickly. So the first ad is that the standards were, ke were, were, were finalists for the uh, Excellence 2011. So it was in for the uh, uh, information technologies at the service of society. 
Unfortunately, we didn't win. But the fact that we were recognized as such means that the quality of our work was recognized. So the stakeholders, well, this is a uh, an annual contest that's 25 years old in uh, technology that recognizes excellence in information technology. The second ad, well, I have to tell you about my second life. Well, I was a public servant for 33 years. I retired last spring, but I'm still active professionally. So I offer services as a strategic consultant, and I do this in relation with uh, standardization, the process of standardization and also standards on accessibility for the web. And also, in, uh, and I'm also a writer. I would also like to tell you that I will be the author of an FAQ on accessibility that will be put online on the Chow Technology website, so they're my partner. And to subscribe to this, uh, uh, it's this address here, eve.udon at ciao slash um, techno.com. Now, Child Technology, the business uh, that I'm partnered up with, offers strategic consultancy services for um, project management, for uh, development of sites and uh, dynamic PDFs that are accessible, and also in the choice of accessible technologies. And Child Technology is proud to be the first member of the uh, Accessibility Club, and it's a plat they're a platinum member. So the cooperative this morning was given out a two-page document that talked about this new service that they're offering. So Child Technology is the first to get involved, and we're very happy about this. So my that's it for my, uh, my plugs, and now we're going to get to the heart of the matter. So over the past few weeks and months, I, I started hearing things about the fact that within the government, we saw that the impact of the implementation of the standards and certain certain estimates were kind of kind of surprised me because I found that it was way too high to to such a point that I said to myself, "Well, it's not very complicated. I'm going to offer my services. I'm going to I'm going to go work for one day free, and I'm going to ask them to pay me one percent of what I will help them save because it's not." a mandatory standard. So I have nothing against, and I'm, I'm very happy that people do more than what the standards require. However, I think that we have to put things in perspective and at least get people to well understand what is a mandatory standard and what do we want to do on top of this. So I encourage you to do more than the standards require, but we have to clarify this. So. And it's even more surprising that we're talking about accessibility. We're not talking about accessibility accessibility since yesterday. We've been talking about that since uh, the mid-90s. We've been talking about accessibility. We've got a first standard of the W3C, the WCAG version 1.0, that was in 1999. So in Quebec, the foundation of the blind had sponsored a study. They evaluated 200 websites in 2003. So already we were talking about accessibility within the community. In 2007, the government of Quebec the, uh, created a committee that was uh, created. There were other assessments of websites that were done. WCAC 2.0 arrived in 2008. So today, it's surprising for me to see such high estimates. I was I'm thinking to myself, maybe some work could have been done gradually beforehand, but it's as if people weren't aware of accessibility, of the existence of accessibility, even though it's been around for over 10 years. So I was saying to myself, well, the higher the estimates, well, the more I have the impression that we did not listen closely enough and we didn't get going early enough. So, when I heard about these estimates, which were quite surprising to me, I said to myself, well, how is it? What can explain this overestimation? And when I thought about it, I found five hypotheses. And the first one was the mandate that was confined, that was, the mandate that was given by the boss, was it clear? So perhaps it's a communications issue. The second hypothesis, did we well understand the room for maneuvering that we had in these standards? 
We're talking about particular cases. We're talking about transitory dispositions. Did we read them, read these standards correctly? Did we understand them correctly? The third hypothesis is that the person that uh, did an estimate of the impacts, did they have sufficient competencies to undertake this work, competence in accessibility? The fourth hypothesis is how did the organization, how does the organization manage the web? Does it have a website? Does it have 20 websites? So this is a consideration. And the last hypothesis is, well, sometimes standards are blamed for just about everything. Maybe we take advantage of it to, to uh, blame stuff on them. So. During my presentation, I will look at these five hypotheses. And firstly, I'm going to uh, give you a warning. I worked 33 years with the government, so um, I've got taken certain habits. Uh, I'm not saying that they're terrible habits, but I've got some very good habits as well. So perhaps I'm going to give you the impression that I'm talking in the name on behalf of the government. And I'm sorry if it sounds that way. And I ask for you to forgive me. This is personal opinion that I'm giving you. I'm not speaking on behalf of the government. If uh, you can you can verify with the director, of the Secretariat du Conseil du Trésor. And here's a little reminder. Well, how does this work? Well, when it comes to standards, we have tried to make it a gradual implementation. We didn't want to do everything at once. So for the first website, or for the first standard, excuse me, well, before somebody asks me the question, I'm going to answer. S-G-Q-R-I. Yes, I am the father of this standard. And perhaps I would do it differently today, but what it means is simply that is it's a standard for the government of Quebec on uh, information technology resources. We can have standards uh, for hygiene and, and food and consumption, but these were uh, standards on informatics. So the first standard that has to do with accessibility, so the 008-01, for those who know it well, well, the, the brand new websites that will be um, developed as of the 10th of May 2012 must conform to standards. For the second standard, which is on uh, a downloadable document, so 008-02, all new documents that are downloadable and put online as of November 10th, 2012, must conform to the standard. Now for the third standard, which is uh, accessibility to multimedia on a website, so 008-03, well, in fact, multimedia, we're talking about uh, audio files, we're talking about video files, and we're talking about web animation or flash animation. So all new elements put online as of the 10th of May 2013 must conform to the standard. There's also what existed when we adopted this, and we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later on. But for intranet and extranet, well, it's the same obligations for delays. Well, not delays, because we've got, we give them a little bit more time to put in place a first standard for intranets and extranets. So we've got until the 10th of May, 2013. For uh, downloadable documents put online, intranet or extranet, we've got till the 10th of May, 2013. And for all new multimedia elements on an intranet, same date, 10th of May, 2013. Now, from the literature I've seen over the past year, I've, saw, I've seen a lot of public uh, administrations in the West, whether it's on the national level or for provinces, departments, states, whatever, um, often they will adopt the level of priority, the AA level of priority of the they'll adopt the level A without saying more about what are we doing with what is in existence, which kind of means that we're adopting the standard, but as of a certain date, everything's got to be uh, in conformity. With well, the approach that was taken, I was going to say that we took, but the approach that was taken at the time within the government was that, in reality, you have to be pragmatic with the standardization. It's not because there's a standard today that tomorrow everybody's going to conform. So we 
have to we have to pick our battles and knowing that the web applications websites have a life cycle you know some sites are almost done some will be there three years five years eight years well this our strategy was to target everything that was new so that's got to be conf that's got to conform and for what's already in place we've got a few exceptions so we had the principle of the um, uh, grandfather clause with a few exceptions. So that's a particularity, that's a characteristic of the work that was done within the government of Quebec. It's to have this approach when it comes to existing websites. So here's a little reminder. Well, in fact, this is the first time that I present this information. So we are happy to have been able to look at WCAB 2.0. We started with 1.0 and then we migrated towards 2.0. And we're very happy this is a source of information that is extraordinary, but which required a few precisions. So what we were reading in 2006, 2007 was that the standard is good. However, it's not detailed enough until it's such a point that we could have said that there were almost as many ways of implementing it as there are people who want to implement it. So in an organization that has one website, 40 web pages, one webmaster, it's not too big a problem because we think it's going to be uh, cohesive from the first page to the last. But often we've got big organizations, we've got some in the region, We've got some, we've got different, for different activities, for different events uh, that come up, and it, it's not always the same team that's, that's undertaking the work. And even within uh, a government agency, we can have different ways of going about things. So when we, when we take, when we put ourselves in the user's shoes, Right? And who has to find a way to navigate all these websites? Well, it's not very obvious. So what we tried to do is we tried to really uh, bring more detail to this. Two years ago, we were saying that uh, overall, the three standards in total, we're talking about 152 requirements. Or I think that two years ago, we said 180, and we've reduced it. And that's quite impressive, right? It, it scared people. And, and these requirements in the first standard, well, the first standard, we've got 68. In the second, we've got 35. And in the third standard, we've got 49, so a total of 152. And I was asking myself, well, is there a way to present this otherwise? And I found that, I found a way. The way and the way that I proceeded was, well, I'm going to try to identify the requirements that we, that go from one, that we find in each one of the standards. And in this case, there are 30 requirements that we find in the first standard, in the second and in the third. There are four requirements that we find in the first and second standards. There are 13 between the first and the third standard, and there are zero between the first and third standard. And for the first standard, there are 21 that are specific to this one that we don't find in the other standards. For the second standard, for downloadable documents, there's only one requirement. And for the multimedia, the third standard, there are six. So this, so in, in essence, it's not 152, it's 75, but it still requires work. And when earlier we were saying, why did we go through this exercise of, of writing these requirements? And I'll give you two examples. In the, in the WCAG 2.0, we've got criteria of success. So as you know, the priority, simple A, there are 25 success criteria. In the double A, we've got 13. And in the triple A, we've got 23 it, for a total of 61 requirements. The three standards, generally speaking, for the government of Quebec are at the double A level, but there are a few success criteria from the AAA as well. So examples are, so the success criteria 1.1, which has to do with equivalent texts, this generated in total, I believe, 23 requirements. So there were, I believe, nine in the first standard, seven in the second, and seven in the third. So that's detail. This is the most important case. And the second case is requirement 131, which has to do with information and relations. And we translated it into 19 requirements, 12 in the first, 3 in the second, and 4 in the third standard. Luckily, the 61 requirements, it's not 10, 15, or 20 requirements. There are several, almost, I'd say almost half 
which gen that generate one, two, or three requirements in each one of the three standards. So the reason why we w went into greater detail is that this is what we saw. So you can well, uh, uh, you know, we consider people, how do you translate this? How do you put this on a website, this success criteria? Well, here, we're in a room. There are maybe 200 people here. Perhaps we would have had 200 different uh, answers. That would be complimentary. And I doubt that everybody would have seen exactly the same thing. Now, we see that for a new website, I was saying that there are 68 requirements. Now, given the approach, given the approach for existing websites with the grandfather clause, well, this is a subtext of these requirements, so it's much less significant. We know that these websites, perhaps in two or three years, they will have to be replaced, and at that point, the new websites will have to conform. And we, and in the standard, we've even led for, well, in reality, there are some websites that exist and that have uh, technologies that are obsolete, second, third generations ago, but they're still there. And it's for sure, even if we require a minimum of standards for these, it could have meant a reorganization. So in these cases, we'll see in greater detail later. So in these cases, these websites, they only have one requirement to meet. And that is that they have to have a website, an accessibility website on the home page that will say <coughs> what, it, what their policy is uh, with respect to accessibility and what the obstacles are. So at least we wanted them to say, well, say, well, it there may be, may contain peanuts, this kind of warning. So for people who are vulnerable, to, uh, to um, strobe light effects, you know, epileptics, while well, knowing that if there are videos on this website or animation, well, it's possible that this may not be good for them. So it's this type of warning that we wanted to put there. That's the intention that we had behind uh, this requirement. So I'll get back now to, do I have any time left for my conference? Yes, okay, so the five, the five hypotheses. So the first one, the mandate that was given by the boss, was it clear? Well, I'm trying to imagine how it works in big organizations. And, and I took the model that I know, so the government of Quebec. So, so once the standards are adopted, well, you've got the, um, You've got a letter sent to all these sub-ministries and all the uh, all the CEOs and the presidents of businesses to say that there are standards when it comes to accessibility, and they must conform to the deadline, so let's say in a year, generally speaking. All right, so it's quite simple. It's one paragraph. It can't be too long. So this is sent to every deputy minister. So the, the deputy minister doesn't see this, his uh, assistant sees it, so they see this and they say, okay, I'm going to take a note, I'm going to send this to the director of communications or to the director of uh, IT. And uh, in passing, I'd like to know how many people here work in, or in communications departments or in companies or offices or um, communication firms that are on contract. Can you can you lift your can you raise your hand just so I get an idea? Okay, so I would say about a thirty about thirty people. There are some people who are shy. So we'll say forty. I'm also going to ask you, uh, people who work in computer science, how many computer scientists are there in the room who either work in for agencies or who work in consultant services uh, with the government? So how many, how many of these people here in the room today? So there are at least 50 plus at least 20 because uh, I, I work in this industry so I know that I'm shy myself. So I know that there are probably 60 to 80 people who work in this. In, in IT. So the assistant has intercepted this letter with the good news and said, okay, well, I've got a director of communications and a director of IT. Who am I going to send this information to? So he looks and he says, okay, accessibility, accessibility of, web, of the website. Okay, so I'm going to send this to uh, the person who's responsible for the website. So it goes to the director of communications. So often that's how things work. Or if I forget, well, at the end of the day, when he's doing his debriefing uh, with his uh, deputy minister, he says, "Oh, well, I received a letter, a standard letter. I don't, I don't know what this has to do with. I, and uh, there's no problem. We're, we're going to get some information on this, especially since you're accountable." So the deputy minister, well, the 
the assistant has to see if he's got to um, going to be held accountable because when the uh, deputy minister um, has to uh, account for what he's done, well, there's got to be answers. So the assistant is very simple. It takes a little memo, sends it to his director. It's quite simple. He says, well, please follow up on this and uh, the deadline, the action plan and estimates for the 30th of the next month. So the director receives this, transmits this to the um, service leader who sends it to the web uh, master. So the way that the web specialist gets this is almost like, bon, okay, well, there are new standards and now the bosses want our website to conform. So tell me how much this is going to cost. And now our specialist does an evaluation, complete evaluation, complete assessment. So this is the order that he got. Even if in the standards we say that for existing websites or uh, transitory websites uh, um, requirements to diminish the impact. So he does an evaluation, a complete evaluation, but that's not what was required in the standard. So there was confusion in the message. Now for now, to fix this situation, to remedy this situation, what I propose is that when we get this type of letter, well, we have to prepare at least two scenarios. The first one, the first one is for, ex I'm talking about existing websites. So a first scenario of cost, I would say, well, to meet the requirements for existing websites is going to cost us this much. We can uh, have a second scenario. We'd say, well, I think that we could do more, and we could do this or that, and we build a program, and we could improve. We could do even more than the standard requires of us. So this, you know, we want people to do this. So the second scenario says, well, in addition to the first one, I could also do this that I will do over time. There are other scenarios too, but I won't get into that. So at least separate things. And this gets back to my metaphor of the elephant, right? Everybody knows how you eat an elephant, right? You eat it bite by bite, one bite, one spoonful at a time. And you can't leave the butter uncovered. So, my metaphor is that we have to really do this over time. So you have to distribute the cost per standard, per obligation, per requirement, and also distribute it according to the um, fiscal years because standards are happening over time and obligations are happening over time as well. So my first reaction when I was told, Eve, in this organization, they estimated the costs at a million or a few million dollars. I was surprised. And I said to myself, well, this reminds me of, you know, there's, do we have any uh, sports fans here, people who watch hockey, football, baseball? No? Yes? How would you, how do you react when you get news? Evie Dahl was, uh, had a lower body injury. What does that tell you? Or Evie Dahl had an injury to the upper part of his body. Well, what does that tell you? It doesn't tell you much. If you go see the doctor with that kind of information, I'm not sure you'll get a good diagnostic. Diagnosis. So when I get an evaluation like this one, my question is always, well, can you distribute this? What standard? What's costing? What year? How much? Well, obviously, if we have an estimate of cost at $50,000, well, that's $50,000. Even if we say that the first year is $20,000 and the second is twenty and the third is ten, dollars well, it's $50,000 anyways. Except that when it comes to the budget, it has it doesn't have the same impact at all. My second hypothesis, did we understand the wiggle room that we have in the standards? So I'm going to take an analogy here. So you know when you go to the restaurant, there's a menu and you have to choose uh, what you want to eat. And the menu of the day, well, in this menu, there, you've got a, a squash flan with a tomato sauce, uh, cordon bleu, uh, veal, and then uh, for dessert, fresh fruit, uh, baked fresh fruit. So I'll ask you the question. You've got 30 minutes, and you're not a vegetarian. You don't like vegetables, and you don't like fresh fruit. What are you going to pick? Well, you've, the chances are good that you'll pick the main meal. And this is kind of the impression that I get when I see, when I hear discussions or I see discussions on the web, people went directly to the heart, to the, the meat of the matter. And if I do an analogy, if I transform the table of contents of a standard, if I transform it into a menu, if I make it into a menu, well, you've got the main meal with the requirements. And an expert, a web expert, a specialist, 
loves this stuff. That they're in there and they love it. I was a developer. I was in IT, and that's where the real stuff is. Okay, we're going to talk honestly. This is where the real stuff is in the requirements. But in the menu, there's also an appetizer, and that's called conditions of conformity. And in these conditions, in the plate, we've got versions. In the standards, we've got dispositions that allow, they say that if there's content or if we cannot make something accessible or if there's content that is hard to make accessible, then there's a possibility of proposing an equivalent version. So we have to know this. All right, so we've got wiggle room here. There are particular cases. What do we do for content that comes from a third party that is not subject to the standards? Well, it's not up to me to do the accessibility work, and I cannot open the document myself. I mean, there is a copyright, there's a question of uh, respecting the author, so there are dispositions there. It's an exception. It's a particular case. There's also uh, web forms. The spirit of the standard is that, okay, well, we're going to concentrate on the form, the forms for the public at large. So that's not exactly how we worded it, but that's, how, that's what it means. So as an appetizer, that's what we've got, and I think it's quite interesting. Now for dessert. We've got transitory dispositions, and we'll look at them later in greater detail, and there's also delays or deadlines. So when we concentrate on the main meal, we forget the wiggle room that we've got within the standards. And my hypothesis is that I think that these this room for maneuvering is not well understood. So what, what do we do with existing websites and the uh, transitory? So the acquired rights are limited by exceptions, and here they are. So an existing website must at least have an accessible web page, uh, which means it has to say, may contain peanuts. I uh, have to say what we have is an obstacle. And we can also indicate that gradually we have, let's say, a three-year uh, timeline that we can improve accessibility. We can do such and such. So, so we can say that. And there's also the home page, the site's home page. So people should be able to have basic information so it be accessible on the home page. There is the site plan. And there is all first three level uh, uh, home pages on a website. So there's also the web forms, a uh, delay of three years. And for these forms, there's a delay of three years. So there are ads, additions, and modifications, uh, all new additions and modifications as of 10, May 10th, 2012, has to be up to standard. It'll be difficult. We don't know quite what the modifications will be. So the five uh, last exceptions are have a condition. So if the accessibility of these elements uh, involves a complete remake, as it were, we say you can present only one uh, accessible web page that explains the situation. Either the technology is outdated, there will be a update, or there are const important constraints currently with uh, existing technology. And we're talking about uh, remake. So if you're remaking a web, an existing website, so it's a new website, basically, and it goes into the program for new websites. So as of May 12, 2000, May 10, 2012, the website has to be to respect the standards. So what is a remake, as it were? Within the standard, we've tried to give a bit of color, as it were. And I'll show you how it's written. It gives you uh, reference points, but it can also be something else. Uh, we can't have an exhaustive li list. It's quite clear, but we've tried to give a bit of what the color of a remake could be. So changing the architecture of an information architecture. For example, organizing navigation elements, uh, web content, and also that little door of the appreciation. There could be something else that's possible. I'll uh, technology changes, going from a static website to a dynamic website. Uh, it could also be a management content change. All 
fusion, if you want, uh, merging of uh, websites, all ch global changes to HTML coding or XML coding or to the style sheet. Uh, so this gives you an idea of what the remake could be. And going to the third question, the person who evaluates the impacts, do they have the necessary competence in accessibility? Uh, when I made this presentation, I uh, had my sweet memories from Lexington, 1977, to visit my parents, and there was an advertisement that struck me uh, that was on the uh, TV, and it was by the Sagné Lexington, Chibougamou, uh, automobile dealerships, uh, and so to go to them, they said uh, basically to get their car repaired, uh, have their car repaired, your car repaired there, they said, well, it's like competence costs a lot, but incompetence costs even more. And so, you know, your corner garage may charge you less over uh, for per hour, but it might take him more time to do it. It might cost take him eight hours to do it, or it could take us two hours. So it's like that's a bit the, the, the spirit of the whole thing. And so I've paraphrased for accessibility, and I've changed it to training cost uh, a lot, but uh, inefficient or uh, insufficient competence costs even more. So in development time, and the result will not be assured. You don't have an assured quality. If you go by ear, as it were, if you play by ear, there are good, some good musicians, but uh, there are some that aren't that great, more often than not. So not only will it cost more, but the result will not be as accessible as if it had been somebody with a good knowledge or sufficient knowledge or competence who had created the site. And after we've changed this website, it will cost more. So I'll be uh, I'll, uh, share a secret with you. I am a uh, programmer, and I get the impression that it's also a question of, and I'll say it with all due respect, it's a question perhaps of asking ourselves questions on how we do things. And I think that uh, programmers are perhaps at a privileged privileged uh, time to ask themselves questions because for accessibility, we have to rethink our way of doing things. And I'll give you an example. For many people, and I think uh, Mr. Bizoki who mentioned it before, accessibility is not a characteristic. They are practices, best practices basically, ways of doing things. And if we want accessibility to be done at uh, 1 minute to 12 when it has to be online for noon. Oh, it's too late. We have to do. We have to change our way of doing things. Accessibility is a preoccupation of all instances, and uh, even more important at the beginning of a project when you will choose the technology to be used. Uh, knowing at 1 minute to 12 that there's a standard or there's and that I cannot program such and such requirement because the tool I've used, it's not going to work, and I have to make an additional layer that will take two weeks, that's that hurts. And f as a result, we have a website that's not accessible. So the project leader, who's an important uh, element in accessibility, I'm not asking him to be a champion of HTML, and I'm not. I will not ask him to be a champion of HTML or a superstar in HTML, but I'll ask him for the importance to share roles and tasks and to rethink the production line in a perspective of having things to do gradually at all times rather than wait until the last minute and do everything that we can't get done. Uh, experience tells me that when competence is insufficient, we have a tendency to overestimate or underestimate costs. Uh, accessibility requires certain things. If we don't know how to do them, it takes more time. Uh, so, in uh, along with the transitory uh, requirements that I mentioned, I have listed the same obligations. Uh, here I've got a table with three columns. Uh, there's nothing here for the uh, screen readers. And the first uh, column, I have the list of the obligations for the transitory 
obligations. Uh, I have a second uh, column after discussion with uh, experts. These are the estimates of the required cost, uh, competence to do certain jobs. And the third column is estimate uh, of costs when there are insufficient competence because I put interrogation points, uh, question points, periods everywhere because uh, it's an unknown factor. And so the writing of an accessible web page, we said two days would be a lot. It would be enough, actually. And I wrote one last week. It took me two, two and a half hours. Perhaps the next will take me less time. If you want to see it, it's on the Child Technology uh, Frequently Asked Questions page. And perhaps the first time it takes you more time, but the second time, normally, you kind of figured it out. So the second time should be uh, done. So once you've done, once the second estimate, it should take you less time to make a second one. And I've tried to present uh, certain uh, stages or uh, requirements uh, for the transition traditional uh, requirements. So these these requirements, obviously, it's not a it's not wall to wall carpeting. Uh, for one element, we could say, well, you know, you took you a day, but that doesn't make sense. It's three days. No problem. But tell me why it's three days. So there's no problem to go to take out these type of requirements, but we just need to know why. The second example, uh, home page, uh, first three levels of navigation, I uh, put in parentheses, uh, it's, the, it's article 25B uh, in parentheses. So the first page perhaps will take me two days, but the following page will probably take me half a day. So these are what I suggest as criteria. And here I will show you an example of the spread. Uh, what happens when you don't have the sufficient knowledge and how the, it just multiplies, <laughs> snowballs. And so uh, first three level pages uh, with my hypothesis of two p days for the first page and half a day for the next pages. So in total, if I have a web page that has five levels, which each has five second levels, so 25 web pages, um, navigation pages. So in total, it should it gives me 14 days of work, roughly. Twice, uh, two, two for the first page and uh, 24 days for the other pages. So somebody who doesn't, who are, who has insufficient competence, uh, they might use three days, but this might be um, multiplied by 25. So when you have each element. Uh, when you multiply them and you uh, make the count, basically, the, the cost could be quite much more. And so when we say there's a multiplier, yes, there are a number of elements in a website, but for organization, you also have to be, you have also have to count the number of websites. And I will get back to that. Uh, and when we're talking about the estimate of the uh, insufficient competence, I can come back. Yes, it took you 75 days per person, but you're what uh, you've met what 70 percent of the standard, and what you've done will be easy to maintain. So there's that point as well. And so there are references that exist on the, on the web. Uh, I think uh, for WCAG 2.0, I think there are about 20,000 pages. That's a lot. Uh, Quebec, the government of Quebec, um, uh, these are available on the uh, Quebec government's website. And also, if you don't have the expertise, uh, it might be a good idea to go get some uh, backup, as it were, when I'm talking about that. It's or accompaniment. It's not to have it done outside, but it's to be to have support references to be able to validate the hypotheses, uh, the starting hypothesis. Uh, and once we have these 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 settings or the these, we can go seek uh, final validation. Fourth question: How does the organization manage? Web. Well, it depends on a de number of uh, websites. It could seem a little uh, uh, like an odd element, but many of you, uh, you work for a company that was uh, maybe 100 people, and you have uh, one website. But in larger organizations, be they public or private, 
you could have 30 or so, 100 we websites. And so if you have a standard for accessibility and you're wondering how much it's going to cost, well, you estimate for one and you'd have a tendency to multiply about, say, by 100. Well, it increases your bill, obviously, or the cost. <coughs> but you have to understand that if there are 10 websites or 50 websites, it's a choice that's been made by the company. And who says choice means let's uh, take responsibility for our uh, for what we've done. So it's not the standard that requires 10 websites. If for some reason it's preferable to have 10 websites, well, the consequences are if you wish to make them accessible, if there's work to be done, you have to multiply. And so my comment is not to say that each organization must have one website, but uh, there are many reasons to have more than one website. But it's perhaps these, uh, you know, uh, to ask ourselves questions on our web inventory. Do we have websites at the end of their usable life? Uh, is this website you still use it or still used? I should say. And it could be an occasion or an opportunity to, uh, let's say, to merge two websites or to do some cleanup. But well, once again, for the uh, cleanup and the metaphor of the 11, do not see that cleaning up is imposed by the standards. So it's like ventilate costs, you know, elaborate costs and evaluate. And last question, are the uh, standards, uh, do they have wide shoulders? Um, from my experience, and not only in regards to accessibility, I had the uh, opportunity to appreciate and to comment on estimates and I'd say five million, seven million, that doesn't make much sense. And so what are they you know, what are they counting here? And so I have the impression sometimes that we could perhaps uh, we've all repaved uh, the parking lot as it were. Like uh, why well there are places for handicapped uh, uh, workers and we're going to paint them, but that's not in included in the standard, so isolate these costs. So to isolate the costs in a distinct so, so basically, these are not imposed by the standards. So isolating the uh, cleaning, uh, so I'll get to my conclusion here. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, setting up of standards in an existing website, the costs are generally very low. I will finish with my metaphor. Uh, I know it's Samuel Sirwa who is responsible for the lunch boxes. He told me this morning that there would be sandwiches, elephant sandwiches. And at the break, he said there wasn't any bread. So I'll leave you with that, and thank you for your attention.